Thank you all again for joining us. Um, this is our sixth Regen WA webinar. And I think so far they've been a really great success. We've been able to then record them all and put them up online so people are able to go back and view them afterwards and press play and pause whenever they want to get that vital information that they may have missed out on in the live version. Um, so today we have Tom Mitchell joining us and he's going to be talking about applying Regen Ag principles in his market garden. So Tom also has an orchard um, and so he applies the principles in his orchard as well. So feel free to ask some questions around that. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we're all Zooming from today, from across WA and Australia and some people in other parts of the world. Um, and pay our respects to the cultural elders of the past, present and emerging and acknowledge their spiritual connection to country. Today, I sit here in Wajak land where it is the season of Makaroo. This season saw the coming of the first rains and allowed free movement across the land to hunt for red meat animals for food and clothing to help ward off the cold. Region WA believes in regenerating our regional landscapes and communities, and we focus on supporting farmers who are investigating alternative production practices with the aim of minimising or reversing the impact of productivity constraints like climate change and soil acidity. I'd like to thank Tom for offering up his time today for us all to be able to learn something more about how he applies Regen Ag in his farm. Um, Tom farms 20 hectares in northwest of Jinjin with his wife Emma and his two daughters. In 2012, they transitioned the business to take a more biological and regenerative approach across the farm. Their enterprise is comprised of a market garden where they grow pumpkins in the summer and mix cover crops in the winter and a lime and mandarin orchard as well. They've introduced cover cropping and green manuring to their market garden operation and have drastically reduced the amount of cultivation and have eliminated the use of all fungicides from their operation, while dr drastically reducing the amount of pesticide use. So I'd just like to hand over now for, oh, if you have questions, pop them in the chat box and I'll make sure that they get asked either at the end or as we go through the session. Now I will turn my volume off and my video off and I will get Tom to share his screen for us, please. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining. Good to see a few familiar names, if not faces um, in the group there. Um, I'll get stuck straight into it. So a little bit, firstly, a little bit about me and, and who I am and, and where I've come from. So I, I grew up in Northern in the wheat belt. Um, not on a farm, um, moved to uh, Perth for a university and studied uh, geology at UWA. Um, and after that worked as a hydrologist predominantly in uh, salt land reclamation in, in southwest of Western Australia. So I did that for about four years. Um, uh, that was back when uh, I guess salinity was a, was a pretty hot topic uh, back in the, the mid, to, uh, mid to late 80s. Um, from there, I sort of progressed and uh, moved on and worked for the Department of Agriculture, mostly out of Mora and Jinjin. And uh, so I had quite an exposure to, to broad acre farming uh, through that. But most of that work was in, in land care um, and a little bit of farm forestry work. In uh, 19, well, prior to 1999, I thought I'd like to try and make a living out of growing things. So I, I had a bit of long service leave and, um, and some annual leave. And so I took that, that off um, and uh, decided to lease a little bit of land in Jinjin and uh, decided that uh, I quite liked doing it and I thought I could make a living out of doing it. Um, and uh, in 1999, I was fortunate enough to meet my wife, Emma, and uh, we bought a property west of Jinjin. Um, so that's where we've been ever since. So in the very early days, um, our approach uh, to our farming um, and to the soil um, that we had on the farm was that the soil was really only there to hold the, hold the plant up, um, that we would try and keep it as bare as possible to try and eliminate any weeds. We didn't want to get a, a population of explosion of weeds um, and we didn't want any carryover from diseases. So um, with the crops we were growing at the time, we were probably rotary hoeing the same piece of dirt between eight and 10 times a year um, to 25 centimetres or thereabouts. In winter, we used to grow Chinese cabbage. So we started out growing Chinese cabbage for export and that was our main crop. Um, so the, our standard practice then was to, to put down a heavy baseline of, of NPK pre-plant, um, pre-emergent herbicides, uh, any post-emergent herbicides that were required, uh, a weekly insecticide, uh, aphids and diamondback moth were a big issue for us. 
Um, so weekly insecticides, uh, a weekly funding fungicide just in case, and uh, we fertigated weekly. In summer, we would uh, grow pumpkins, um, watermelons occasionally, uh, and again, so a, a heavy NPK pre-plant, um, a post-emergent herbicide if that was required, if we had grasses as an issue. Uh, fertigate weekly, um, insecticide and fungicide as required. Um, fungicides usually uh, um, a couple of couple before flowering. Um, the establishment of the pumpkins um, left us very exposed, so we direct seeded. So we would rotary hoe until we had uh, nothing, no organic matter left on the on the surface for protection, um, and we left it let us left us very exposed to, to wind blasts and learned that lesson very very quickly with the, the loss of some crop. Um, so that's essentially um, a view looking uh, west um, on our property. So market garden in the foreground. Um, some uh, fairly bare exposed ground. So that was the level we had to cultivate to in order to do our direct seeding. So you can see very small uh, Chinese cabbage plants in the foreground um, and the bare ground that hasn't been seeded in the, in the background. Um, so just a description of the site, it's, uh, it's quite hilly. So that hill's uh, got about a 10% slope on it. Um, it's about 400 metres in length um, and a gradient of about 10%. Uh, mostly uh, red gum and chewet country with a little bit of Bank sure at the at the top of the hill, but shorts in the in the valley there that you can see, um, and red gums are the predominant um, species. So the Chinese cabbage uh, again, that was uh, you know what we started off with, and that's where we were able to establish the farm doing that. So as you can see by the photo, that's uh, 2003. Um, and so that was our, what I did my learning in. A very good friend that said if you could grow Chinese cabbage, you can grow anything. So. We'll see. Um, why did we change? So why did we stop doing um, the things we were doing um, uh, previously? There's a lot of, lot of different factors that, that uh, contributed to that and they all seem to come together about the same time and I think our awareness was erased because of some of the things that were coming up as well. Um, as a means of expanding our operation, we leased a little bit of land um, and uh, we were quite excited about that. It was about 20 acres that we decided to plant the pumpkins. Um, it hadn't had anything growing on it for a very long time. So we were really confident that uh, we didn't have any disease issues there. And, and a lot of gardeners will talk about the first time they ever grow on a piece of dirt, that that's when they get their best returns. Um, so we're pretty, pretty happy that that might be the case with this block. Um, as it turned out, we, uh, <clears throat> this was in 2010, um, we didn't realize that it was uh, completely infested with nematodes. Uh, root knot nematode and so uh, we didn't actually pick a single pumpkin off the 20 hectares so that cost us a little bit of money. Um, <clears throat> also around about that time there were um, biological products entering the market and my feeling was that we that I knew nothing about the biological products I didn't know anything about biology uh, to be honest um, so I wasn't confident in buying products or applying products because I really had no idea what they were supposed to be doing or, or what they might do and whether they were beneficial or not, um, or how to assess what they might be doing. Um, I also didn't love using chemicals. I don't think many people do. Um, and at the time we had a young family, uh, we were establishing the orchard. Um, so we were under the impression that we were going to be sort of applying a fair few chemicals on the orchard. and. Uh, that that would be a, an issue around the house. Um, and around about that time, we, we met a, a biological consultant just by chance. He, uh, his wife is the local doctor in Jinjin and uh, we got to know each other socially um, and got chatting and obviously you chat about farming because that's what farmers do. Um, and uh, yeah, so we had a combination of all those things that came together and uh, I think that was a stimulus for, for looking at maybe doing something a little bit differently. The nematode issue was, the, I guess, a real turning point because I, I wasn't a big fan of, uh, of getting out and using nematicides to, to knock them off and started looking at some of the um, more biological approaches that we could have taken, so increasing organic matter and, and getting some good bugs in there. <coughs> um, so that's an example of what happened with the, with the nematodes. Um, the Ag Department now very proudly uses photos of my root knot nematode on pumpkins in their, one of their pamphlets. So it was a pretty severe infestation. And, and as I said, we didn't, uh, we didn't pick any pumpkins from that area. 
<clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, the, the slope we live on or the hill we live on is, uh, is about 10%. It is sand. Um, and if you have a very heavy rainfall event uh, in about March in, a, in 2010, um, most people remember that big hail storm that hit the city. Well, this was 60 millimetres of rain in 20 minutes. And that's the day we discovered that uh, our land drained to that point. Our neighbours on either side also drained to that point. And that just happens to be where we locate our uh, irrigation pump and bore. So we needed to do something to address that. Um, we had started playing around a little bit with, uh, with growing cover crops in um, the market garden, but it was more about trying to provide organic matter for our orchards. So we grew an oat crop um, and uh, we would transfer the, the oats up into the orchard and, and mulch underneath our trees. So we'd, uh, we were fortunate enough to have a, a, a loose and grower next door who had a baling equipment, baling gear. So he baled up for us and uh, we had to cut it up, of course. He didn't do that for us. Um, I just want to go back to that. Um, what we did find was that we had some real issues with uh, how much nutrient was being taken out of the market garden. So we were removing all of, all of what we'd uh, grown there and putting up into the orchard, which was great for the orchard. But uh, we found that with our pumpkins, we were having to add more and more uh, inputs to, uh, um, to get uh, reasonable crops from them. So we, we started sort of looking at different ways of doing things. So with the assistance, I guess, of, of our um, good friend and biological consultant, we, um, he actually came to a training course with me in, uh, in Queensland. Um, and then that just started, the, I guess, the pathway of, of wanting to know more and, and learn more and understand more. Um, I didn't have any formal training in, in horticulture and, and growing. So for me, some of this stuff was new. Um, so yeah, once I started learning, then it, it just becomes self-perpetuating. And we, uh, well, I spent a lot of time uh, at seminars and going to workshops, reading books and, uh, and just trying to expose myself to different ideas and what people are doing, uh, watching videos online, going to conferences, um, and reading more books, and I'm not a I'm not a great reader um, at, at in most times or the best of times, and uh, I have read more books in the last 12 years, I think, in the in the previous lots of more years before that, without giving too much away. Uh, so some of the things we started playing around with uh, in the market garden um, was was things like plant, applying compost, so trying to increase our organic matter, um, that was our our approach then. Um, we did a bit of banding for the, the pumpkin, so we would, we would put that out. Um, we were limited in, in what gear we had and what we could use to do that, but uh, they're sort of some of the things we played around with. Um, again, we sort of uh, had cultivated things pretty heavily in there. Um, <clears throat> what drives us now, or what, what, uh, what is our thinking now? Sort of why do we do the things we do? So I guess the package that I've, I've pulled together now in terms of what principles we, we farm on, uh, are some of those things that are listed there. So some people um, uh, will be familiar with the five principles of soil health. Um, so keeping some cover on the ground at all times, uh, trying to have something growing at all times. So you've got a living root in the system, um, having or well, maximizing the amount of diversity you have in plant species and in the ground, um, minimizing the amount of soil disturbance and trying to incorporate animals into the system. So they're sort of standard ones that, that most people are familiar with. Um, the thing that I, I guess I have learned the most is, is with regards to plant nutrition. And plant nutrition for me drives, um, it drives everything, it drives production, uh, but it also drives insect and, and disease attacks. So um, for us and, and our philosophy and the way we farm, um, if we can keep the plant healthy, then uh, we can um, build up resistance to, to insects and disease. Um, and that's, we've seen that uh, evidence on the farm and. Uh, um, it's, it's a very big part of, of what we do. Um, the other things that, that I'm able to do now that I probably wasn't able to do uh, prior to um, going through this learning process, um, and it's essentially been a, you know, an eight year degree um, of flat out learning all the time, is, is just understanding what things are harmful to soil function uh, and what things are, are beneficial. And so, our practices on the farm where possible is we, we try and minimise those things that are, that are damaging and try and increase the things that are beneficial. Um, and I guess the learning has enabled me to work out what things those, those are 
Um, and if we're able, if we are doing things that are harmful to, to soil function, then looking at the sort of things we can do to, um, to overcome that or to reverse the damage we might have done. So we started playing around with getting some more diversity into our, uh, into our market garden. Um, so this is uh, crimson clover that we included in one of our, our cover crops. So our system currently is to, we grow pumpkins over summer and then the winter is purely for cover crop and building soil, um, soil function and soil health. So legumes went in um, as a means of, of trying to uh, capture some nitrogen and um, reduce some of our inputs for our pumpkin crop. crop. Um, peas were a, a great addition and they did really, really well in our soils. Calcium is quite high in our soils and as is pH um, and peas and, uh, and most of the legumes do really, really well. Um, sadly, the issue with peas is that uh, they run up to flower and to seed very, very quickly. So um, the issue we had in the following pumpkin crop was that pea was our biggest weed. Um, so there's some of the challenges with selecting species you might use in a, in a current crop. Uh, so just a picture there of some of the nodulation. So we've we've now moved to a vetch, and the reason we've gone to a vetch is because it's uh, it's more long longer season. So I, I can be sowing a cover crop as early as uh, mid March, and I need that to carry through until about mid September. So if there's any flowering and fruit set uh, or seed set in that time, then there's potential for that to be a weed in in the pumpkin. So I want to try and minimise that as much as possible. So we, we included a brassica into our system last year. And uh, the reason for that is because as most gardeners will know with uh, lots of cultivation, you, you build up a hard pan layer. So the intention of the brassica was to not only create some diversity in, in species, but also to try and penetrate through that um, hard pan layer and give a pathway, pathway for, the, uh, for the pumpkins to go down. Um, and it grew really, really well. Um, it did the job we wanted it to do. So you can see this was, uh, um, this was October uh, of last year. And so it certainly did the job of identifying or finding the hard pan, but it made its way through it. So um, it at least uh, provided a pathway for, for the pumpkins to get through that. And that did a fantastic job. Um, unfortunately, um, the, the job it did was, was, was very beneficial, but it, it also became a big weed in our in our pumpkin crop because um, my practices in, in terminating the cover crop uh, and burying it meant that all of those little shoots that you can see down near the bottom of the, of the root there were fragments of plant that decided they wanted to grow as well. So um, we, we had one of our biggest weeding issues in that year, but we've, we managed to overcome that in the second and, and third planting. Just an indication of, of how big that brassica can get. So that's a single plant next to the bike and it's a plant that that covered, uh, sorry, that carried through um, our entire pumpkin season. So it was on the fringe of our, our pumpkin crop. Uh, so it got to that, that sort of size. I think it got a small grazing early on with the, with the mulcher, um, but it hasn't flowered. And so from a cover crop point of view, that was really beneficial for us because it means it wasn't going to set a seed and, and, and I haven't seen it set any seed at all. So it's great for a cover crop because I can carry it through for as long as I need. Um, and it does the job that I needed to do in the time frame that I needed to do it in. <clears throat> uh, oats we include in that uh, cover crop mix as well. Um, they're great scavengers, uh, really good at picking up nutrition that may have maybe still present there after the pumpkins, although pumpkins are very good at scavenging as well. Um, and they're very good at forming associations with soil biology. So um, yeah, that's, that's one of the big benefits there. So one of our challenges, if you think back to those five soil principles is, is about reducing cultivation and trying not to disturb the soil. So uh, last year we invested in a, a small disc seeder, a double disc opening seeder. Um, so we use that now um, to put our cover crop in. So it eliminates a, a, a working. So the previous practice would have been to uh, have cultivated in the pumpkins, to have used the fertilizer spreader to sp spread the se uh, seed on top and then tickle it in again with the, um, with the rotary hoe. And I think that's pretty common practice for, for a lot of people that put in, in cover crops. So this enabled us to reduce at least one of those cultivations. Um, we did try um, a section last year where we uh, sprayed out the pumpkins. So um, got, killed that off and then direct seeded straight into the pumpkins. And that was, that was quite successful. 
Um, but the question that I have now is, uh, am I getting more benefit out of the reduced um, cultivation by using the disc machine straight into the pumpkins? Um, or am I, uh, or I, am I getting a better uh, return from uh, uh, cultivating it first and then, and then uh, seeding it in? As far as plant establishment goes, um, there wasn't a great deal of difference. Um, the only difference, I guess, was either a cultivation or a herbicide use. And so they're, they're the, the things that I'm balancing with at the moment and, and still trying to learn how, how I might address that. What it did do is it enables to give us a very good, um, even uh, establishment of our cover crop. And uh, it also meant that we've probably reduced our, the amount of seed we use uh, to get the same sort of plant densities. Uh, by about up to uh, 60%. So we're using about a third of the seed that we were using you know, previously, just thinning it out. Um, so that's uh, my dog, uh, Gus, uh, for scale. Um, and so that's uh, not too far off being termination. So in that mix, we, we just had a, a forage oat. So again, using a forage oat because it's a much longer season. Um, so I, it does start to, to form a head, but we haven't had mature seed in there. Um, the grazing brassica and also a vetch, which is a, you know, the longest, uh, longest vetch that we could get, season vetch we could get um, to carry us through. So once we're, uh, when we're in the termination phase of the cover crop, so this will be about mid-September, um, I use my orchard mulcher, um, which I'd normally use to mulch up prunings in the orchard. So I use that to break it up to as small particles as, a, as I can. Um, I don't actually want to eliminate all of it. Um, I want to try and keep some of it uh, um, left in the, in the soil profile. And uh, I want the bugs working away flat out on that um, while my pumpkins are still growing. Um, it's all going in green. So obviously there's, um, there's not that big issue with, uh, with nitrogen drawdown. I'm, I'm sort of contributing to that. Um, one of the issues in, in market gardening, um, particularly if you're growing a vetch, um, the vetch, uh, by the time the weather starts warming up, um, is very aggressive. And if you've got a, a framework there that's been built with the oats, um, the vetch is very, very good at climbing up that. It's also very good at climbing up sprinklers. So uh, some of these lines I've, I would have had to have gone through and walked them and uh, trodden down all the cover crop around the sprinklers um, so that I could see where they are when I'm mulching. Um, so that's what it looks like after the, after the cultivation. Um, so I'm still leaving a bit of uh, material on top. Um, for, the last, um, for the last eight years, since I've been doing this, um, I've managed to have sleep, you know, lots of sleep um, during that October, November period where we get a lot, usually get a lot of strong easterlies, so sorry, south easterlies. And that's the time we've lost crop in the past. Um, I haven't had to, to put sprinklers on to stop areas from blowing in that, in that time. And, uh, just the, the mental relief that that gives is, uh, is worth every penny. So you can see the, the, the mulched and the, um, uh, and the cultivated next door to each other. That's uh, what they look like. Uh, what are some of the other things we do, we do on the farm um, that might be considered regenerative or, or a biological approach? So we, we seed coat um, our pumpkins. Um, our pumpkins are, if I just go back to that slide, our pumpkins are seeded by hand, so we don't use a machine to do that. Um, we do it all by hand, um, which means that it gives us the ability to, to leave that amount of trash on the soil um, because we don't have to be out, worry about handling that with any machinery we're using. Um, when we're, we're putting um, seeds in, so we will uh, use a compost extract that uh, we may have developed ourselves, so we, we do a little bit of composting. Um, we put a trace balance on. We have used worm juice in the past. And, we're, and we've used mycorrhizal uh, inoculants. Um, when we're putting our pre-plant fertilizer out now, rather than a, an MPK fertilizer now, we use a, a pelletized composted chook manure um, and we add zeolite into that. Um, so zeolite is a clay, um, very, very good at hanging on to potassium and ammonium ions. And we just add a, about 10% of the, the poo pellet is zeolite. So it enables us to hang on to the nutrition that's in the, uh, in the poo pellet, um, uh, as well as uh, you know, a bit of water as well. It's not big volume, so you know, um, clay generally you're talking you know, 30, 50 or more tonnes to the hectare. 
um, we're putting out somewhere around about 50, um, 50 kilos to the hectare each year. So it's, it's a short term, but if, I guess if I'm on the farm long enough, we might get up to those sort of, those sort of amounts. It's a, it might be a fair stretch. Um, when we're doing any uh, fertigations, we will use humix in humix, particularly if you're putting urea out. Um, we want that there to, to try and hang on to the, the nitrogen as long as possible, so it's available to the plant. Um, whenever we're doing any fertigations, um, foliars, uh, herbicide applications, and I'll use a fulvic acid. So again, fulvic's there to provide a bit of food for, for biology and also to hang on to any nutrition we might be putting out. I use molasses in, in foliars and in herbicides. So molasses is a very good um, bacterial food. Um, and it's also quite, uh, I have used it in the past as a, uh, as a UV protectant. There was a little bit of work that was done uh, a few years ago on, on that. So if I'm putting out um, insecticides, if I need to do that, uh, don't do that very often anymore, but if I need to do that, then it, it helps uh, some of those ones that do break down under, under UV light. Again, so fish, fish in our foliars and in fertigation, fish is very good uh, fungal food. Um, so we, we include that when we can. Um, in the last eight years, we haven't used uh, any fungicides um, in our pumpkins. We, uh, we irrigate uh, with overhead sprinklers um, and we also irrigate at night uh, and only at night. Um, part of that is the fact that power is cheaper at night, so that's a, that's a benefit. Um, but we've found that uh, you know, watering during the day, when particularly when it's hot and you've got evaporations of 10, 12, 14 um, millimetres, then uh, it's, it's really not worth doing any watering it during the day um, to, uh, uh, to get enough water on for plant use at least. So uh, the thing that we focused on very heavily, I think I mentioned earlier, was uh, plant nutrition. So we leaf test uh, regularly. Every pumpkin crop is leaf tested. And that might not give us the information we need for that particular crop or for that season. Um, but we do three different plantings of pumpkins in a season. And so for each uh, success of planting, we're able to assess where we may or may not have things right in the, in the previous planting. So we, we make small adjustments if need be. Um, we soil test probably once every two to three years um, on, on the patch, just to see what's happening there. Um, and see so, so if there's anything that's changing, we hadn't, uh, we're not necessarily picking up. And we also use uh, moisture monitors. So every, every crop has a moisture uh, probe in there. So we're able to look at uh, what's happening. And that, they were very, very handful, helpful. And they were the things that convinced me that watering during the day wasn't, uh, just wasn't uh, viable. Um, we, uh, we would run sprinklers for half an hour to an hour, putting on maybe eight mils of water uh, in that time during the middle of the day and see no response whatsoever at the uh, 10 to 15 centimetre level in, in our crop. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we use still a little bit of composting. So for those of you that are familiar with uh, Johnson Sioux um, bioreactors, uh, we had a bit of a play with those. Um, so that was when they were first established. And that was uh, nearly two years ago now. So we're still, they're still active. We still keep them going and we'll take samples from that and, and include those as, a, as an inoculum for uh, our pumpkin seed. And we're still, I guess, learning on how, how else we can use that, how else we can apply that to, uh, to our system. This, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but this is a three, three row seed uh, weeder. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we have two girls and my wife Emma as well, um, who helps out. So we do a lot of hand weeding. We try and avoid using chemicals in the market garden for, for post-emergent weeds if we can. There really aren't a lot, well, there's none, that, that are available to use in, in terms of broadleaf in pumpkins uh, that I'm aware of. Um, and grasses, there are grass selectors that we can use if, if need be, but uh, as much as possible, we um, you know, try and get out in the, in the sun and the peace and the quiet and do a bit of weeding. It's very th therapeutic. So this is pumpkins. Uh, I guess we're probably getting to about mid-November there. So. Um, that's, uh, I'm at row closure there, so uh, um, yeah, most of, most of what I can do has been done that's just, just pre-flowering, so we'll, any fertiliser we want to put on now will go out through the sprinklers. So what are some of the, the challenges we've got for the future on the farm? Um, 
again, I, I keep coming back to those those principles that I had on, the, on an earlier slide um, and some of the things that we're doing and, um, and things we want to achieve. We can't do all of those. Um, you know, putting animals in the system is a real challenge for us. For us, so they're one of the things that uh, I guess when I yeah, when I've exhausted all my other options, I'll, I'll look at ways that we can include uh, animals in our system. I'd still like to add a little bit more diversity into our into our cover crop. I think there's possibility for that. Um, I just need to uh, do a bit more research and, and, and have a bit more bit more of a play. Um, assess the risks of whether they're going to become weeds in, in my pumpkins and, and how I deal with them in a, um, a termination phase. Um, I, I really want to um, reduce tillage as much as possible. I, I think that's probably one of our biggest inhibitors uh, for building soil carbon on, on our sandy soils. Um, I think in the orchard we've got the advantage of not having any cultivation up there so we, we have seen organic metal levels increase in there. But there's so much, uh, so much aeration when you uh, turn, I mean, you till uh, these sandy soils that uh, the biology goes nuts and breaks down anything that, uh, that you might have buried or, or might be under the ground or any organic matter that might be there. So it, I know it's possible, um, but these are one of the things that um, I guess in that transition phase or in adopting some of these more biological approaches or regenerative approaches is that you, you may not be able to do all of them. Um, and, and I accept that, um, that we can't do all of them. And uh, that there's a, I guess essentially, there's probably not an end point um, to, to doing the regenerative, but there's a, there's a pathway to get there. So we're trying to achieve as many of those things along that pathway as we can, um, that fits into our system. And that's the critical point is that it needs to fit into to your individual system. So for us, um, we have we've done a bit of a bit of travelling around. We went to the states a few years ago and uh, had a look at properties there, and went to a property where a fellow grows cover crops. Uh, he roller crimps them in and directs seeders in the one action. So roller crimper on the front of the track, front of the tractor, and uh, air seeder, pumpkin air seeder on the back, and it's all a single operation, no cultivation, and uh, that does that does a great job. We're a very small operation. Um, those sort of bits of gear aren't readily available in Australia. Um, we could have them built or we could make them, but uh, I've got to weigh that up against the scale of our operation and can we justify the cost of, uh, of that, that implement uh, to do that job. Um, we are still in the process of, uh, of testing our fertilizer limit, fertilizer limits um, and how low we can go. Uh, since we've been growing biologically, we've uh, uh, more than halved our, certainly our nitrogen inputs. Um, and our potassium inputs um, in, in what we're doing. And uh, last year is the, the eighth year that we've been doing this. And uh, we, for the last two years, we've broken our yield records and with our pumpkins. So um, I think it's important to, to know sort of what things you can tinker with and what things you can't tinker with um, and not to do it in a, in a cold turkey sort of way. Uh, we learned that lesson very early on. And uh, We've had to, uh, I guess, grind our way back to, to where we thought we would be um, at, the, at the start, um, naively um, back then. So we, um, yeah, we're still reducing, reducing the inputs we, we put into the crop. And uh, I think we've still got a little way to go. Um, so again, this other exercise of experiment and just see, uh, see what we can achieve. Um, Trees and shrub species, it's not something we've focused on a lot in the past, but uh, becoming more aware of, I guess, some of the ecosystem surfaces that, um, that trees and shrubs bring to us. We're, we're fortunate um, in the area we live, we have uh, a lot of trees uh, still around, a lot of big trees around. We don't have a lot of shrub species around and that's, I guess, pretty typical of, um, of those areas. Um, so, uh, we don't have, at the moment, we don't have any problems with, uh, with bees and pollination. Um, we have brought in bees in the past, but we've found that uh, we have sufficient um, bees in the area that, to do our pollination. So, um, but, you know, we're very conscious of the fact that uh, that may not be forever. And, and perhaps if we can provide an environment where bees would be happy to live on our farm, then uh, um, that'd be a great service to us. Um, I'm still looking at ways to try and incorporate animals into the system. Um, it's, uh, I guess it uh, highlights um, where your interests lay and, and, and I do like animals. Um, it's not that I'm against animals, but I think uh, 
perhaps like a lot of broadacre guys uh, have done who, who may have gone out of animals. Um, I quite like going to a summer without having you know, to worry about whether they might have water or not. I'm unlikely to have animals on the farm during summer, but um, during winter, it's, it's just another thing to think about. And uh, winter time is usually our, our citrus time. So I've got other things to think about already. So uh, I, I haven't got my head around how to do that yet. Um, one suggestion has been to is to stack another enterprise onto ours. So uh, maybe have a chat to a neighbour who has animals um, and let them uh, lease our, our market garden and uh, uh, for grazing purposes. Um, but I need to weigh that up against uh, the benefit we get out of the cover crop and uh, the inputs that's providing and um, whether we'd get any additional benefits by, by having animals in the system. Um, and part of what I guess I've talked about in those previous points is, is how do you balance out the, the challenges of um, you know, your, your social challenges, your financial challenges and, in, and environmental challenges. So I think we tend to focus fairly heavily on financial. Um, most farmers do. They, they, most of the decision making, I think, is, is around dollars. Um, is this going to return me any dollars or not? Um, and I think uh, social fairs is fairly high up on that um, list as well in terms of priority. Uh, you know, I've just highlighted myself how, you know, I, my life's a lot easier if I don't have animals in the system. So it's a trade off. Uh, it's a social trade off for me. That, I get to spend more time doing the things I want to do and, and with family and, uh, and friends um, without being tied up as to and having to look after animals uh, on the farm. Um, we do, uh, you know, I think we do a bit environmentally as well. Uh, a lot of our practices are, I guess, driven by dollars, but there's a, an environmental impact as a result of that. So reducing our fertilizer inputs, you know, we sit on, a, on an aquifer that's uh, uh, vital to the area. Um, there's likely to be a fair bit of recharge from our area um, that uh, is, is going into our groundwater system and to neighbouring groundwater systems. And we know that our neighbours drink the water that they pump out of the ground. It's uh, some pretty good quality in some spots. And I know um, from an industry point of view, there have been issues in the past with uh, nitrates entering, entering groundwater systems. So if we can reduce that, then, then all the better. And I don't think uh, you know, any of us stop stop learning. Um, uh, I've still a lot, a lot more that I need to need to know and need to learn um, and how we might adapt our farm and what we might do. Um, often when I go to uh, seminars or conferences or workshops, um, people are, the first question people generally ask is where do I start and what do I do? So I thought I'd just list a, a few of my thoughts about um, things, things you might do if you're looking at starting out. Um, and the top of the top of the list for me, if I hadn't have gone to uh, training courses and, and listened to seminars and read books, um, I wouldn't have understood what I need to understand to make the decisions I make on the farm. And so I think that's um, you know taking responsibility for your own learning. And I, I wasn't confident um, in the earlier days when you know you had resellers bringing products out to for you to try. And I might like the resellers and I might you know, um, think they're great people, but um, I didn't have the knowledge to assess whether what the products they were bringing me was, were, were going to do the job I wanted them to do. So, so I think taking responsibility for your own learning, so understanding um, a bit about what you're doing is, is critical. And for me, that's the first step. Um, use the networks that are available. Um, I also sit on the, the Region WA um, steering committee. Um, so I, I understand the importance and, and now realise the importance that having a, a, a network of people that are, that are doing things, um, the, particularly in Broadacre, that networks in Broadacre are very, very good. Um, and I think we're building a, you know, I think we have nearly 200 farmer members of that network. So it's a space where people are able to share what they're doing um, and, uh, and hopefully increase adoption of, of some of the things we're talking about. Um, start small. Don't don't do what I did. Um, we did the whole planting and the whole market garden in, in one year, and um, we were fortunate enough we didn't come a gutsa uh, of doing that. But uh, start with small areas and and just play play with the learning and uh, working out what you need to do and how you might go about it. Uh, and introduce practices as as your enterprise allows. Um, we haven't got to where we are now with, with just one single leap. 
Um, we've we've tinkered with things, we've uh, changed things, we've learnt things along the way that um, have meant that we've had to change some of the things we might have done in the past. So we, uh, yeah, we just introduced those things that you know, money might let, not let you allow um, or might not allow you to implement some of the things you want to implement. You know, I bought the double disc seeder last year. So we were seven years in before I thought, you know, maybe this is something I can try now. And finances allowed us to do that. Um, and it was just taking another step in, in that pathway to, to getting towards the, the end that may or may not exist. Um, I think importantly, when you're first starting out, um, and this is why it's important, I think, to, to go through that learning process initially, um, is to be aware of conflicting practices. So if there's things that you're doing on farm, um, and the classic examples is applying fungicides. So if you're flat out trying to build um, fungal populations in, in your soil um, and, uh, and you're a heavy fungicide user, they're probably not gonna go too well together. So it's, um, you know, often you, you know, you'll get people who will sell you a product that you think is going to build a, a great fungal, you know, fungal environment and they may not necessarily have asked whether you're, you're heavy into fungicides or which fungicides may or may not affect um, what you're using. Um, I think, and this comes back to, to the learning, um, you know, being, being aware of what, what's possible and what practices are, are out there enables you to design a system that works for you. Um, what I do on my farm won't work for everybody. Um, <clears throat> you know, even growing Chinese cabbage, um, taking this sort of approach, growing Chinese cabbage is, uh, is gonna be a challenge. And uh, I think when I, when I run out of puff and, and run out of ideas, maybe I'll go back and grow some Chinese cabbage and just see how I can, how I can make that work. Cause I have learned a lot since we grew Chinese cabbage and I know there's things that we would, we would like to play with but it's, it's not the right time just yet, but I, I hope to get into that. I think that's uh, just about wraps me up, I think, Shay. Thanks, Tom. Um, there's been quite a few questions that have come through as you've gone through, but what I'll leave them to the end. So I'll start off with the first one. I know I obviously picked up lots from what you've talked about, um, but it's good to have the questions as well. So one of the, um, Neil asked, do you know the increase in organic matter percentage in the soil as a result of your cover cropping? Yeah, I, I haven't seen um, a great deal uh, of increase. So we took uh, um, organic matter levels when we first bought the block. Um, I think we were around about 0.9 um, you know, organic carbon then. Uh, we've been as high as 1.3, um, but we probably hover around that one. So no, no great increase. And to be honest, I don't expect to see any great increase. I, I wouldn't expect to see that until we had our cultivations down to zero. Um, it's just so detrimental to, to soil carbon and I mean growers know uh, how quickly organic matter breaks down uh, when they're cultivating and that's that's why they do it because they need to do it for bed preparation and I understand that um, and that's you know that's something we uh, yeah that's a challenge that's ahead of us. You said you did some organic matter tests when you first got the place yeah. and that was a good starting point are you going to go back and do any more tests in the near future do you think? Well as I said we we soil test um, reasonably regularly, so maybe every three three years or thereabouts. Um, uh, the last one's probably only two years ago, so we're probably due in the next 12 months or so to do some more. Um, so it's a regular thing for us. Um, and it, it's, it's organic matter, but it's also other things that we're looking at as well. Um, you know, we're trying to assess what's going on. Uh, we we will, will be part of a, a, a natural capital accounting project, um, which uh, yeah, we're in the middle of now and uh, that'll involve a fair bit of testing so I, I think that'll be um, assessed rigorously um, in the next uh, 12 months or more. Yeah um, so if anyone had there's more questions that have come but if you have a question as it comes up make sure you put it in the chat box and I'll make sure I get to ask Tom. Um, someone asked do you do any BRICS testing? Uh, we do a little bit um, I haven't haven't done a lot lately and um, it's it's just slack on my behalf to be honest. Um, we, uh, yeah, we, we did in the very early days and uh, um, I guess it's an indication of, of how well the system's going that we haven't been because uh, we, we haven't had insect attacks and we grow a crop that's not, you know, it's not overly um, susceptible to, to insect attacks. We, we do have some cutworm problems. Um, we will have heliothus in them occasionally. Um, yeah. We, 
we, we don't tend to get a, a lot of attacks. And so um, I haven't been worried about plant health and uh, you know, the plants generally look pretty good most of the time. So um, if I had issues, then I'd, I'd probably do more monitoring. Um, but it's, uh, I think I'm just making excuses for, for being a bit slack. Fair enough. Um, so when you mulch your cover crops, do you have any issues from stable flight? We haven't. Um, not monitoring for it, mind you. So that's, you know, um, anecdotally, um, we know in the area when, when uh, someone has, has spread manure or um, maybe hasn't done the right thing. Um, then yeah, we, we, we get attacks. We've got a dog, so he's, he's, our, he's our sentinel. Um, so he lets us know when things are going wrong with stable fly. Um, we haven't had numbers of stable fly for a very long time. Um, I think the question may have come perhaps when they saw the size of the stalk on, the, uh, on that brassica, um, because that, that's a potential issue. But we, we haven't seen it uh, and we're out in the field all the time when the cover crops in. So we'd, we'd certainly know if it was an issue, yeah. Yeah. Um, have you considered syntropic farming to get the benefit of succession and include agroforestry and horticulture into the mix? Oh, syntropic. Haven't heard of syntropic. Um, so maybe a little bit of clarification on that. Um, clearly, I need to read more books. Um, have I had a bit to do with agroforestry? Um, we, we've got a very small plot, is, is what I should, should say. So uh, the market garden's five hectares. So incorporating, uh, yeah, we have, have windbreaks around the outside. We have shelter belts around the outside. Um, one of the big issues for us, particularly on a small property, is shade. And uh, even with some of the native vegetation, the, the realms that we've left there, we know there's areas of the garden that get shade um, that, you know, that impacts on production. Um, so, yeah, it, it's balancing those. I think on a bigger scale, perhaps we'd, we'd have more luck with that. Uh, we do have um, windbreaks, as you know, in, in the orchard. So we use that for protection up there. Um, we have tried planting uh, shelter belts in the orchard as well. Um, and we have had issues uh, with competition uh, within the trees, um, with the, the, the plantings that we put in. It's just identifying the right species, I think. But on these soils, when you irrigate the, the trees, they find it, they find the water and they find the food and uh, yeah, they compete pretty heavily. Yep, so I suppose one of the questions that I had was like your economies of scale. So do you think some of the stuff that you implement and able to do on your place is something that like a big, a bigger farmer or like a person who's got a bigger crop size would be able to do? Or would they just have to adjust it to suit them? Exactly, yeah. I, I mean, there's <laughs> um, the bigger growers out there would have seen my three row weeder and, uh, and gone, you just can't do that on 200 hectares. And, and I agree. Um, so, you, yeah, there's, there's limitations to what, what could be done on a bigger scale, um, but some, a lot of the things are scalable. Um, mm. you know, I, I don't think we're restricted too much by, um, you know, by lack of machinery or, you know, I, I think we get things done reasonably efficiently, but, uh, but the point's valid. Um, there's some things that uh, you may not be able to achieve on a, on a bigger scale that we do on our smaller scale. But if, I mean, Doing what we do is a mindset thing. If, if you want to do it bad enough, you'll find a way to do it. And I mean, farmers, growers, they do that all the time. Um, if they want to solve the problem bad enough, they'll do it. Yeah. Um, so we talked a lot about your market garden, but I also mentioned that you had an orchard. So what practices are you implementing in the orchard? Okay, so orchards, as I mentioned earlier, is a little bit, little bit not easier, um, it's different. Um, but we don't cultivate in the orchard, so we don't do any cultivation at all. Um, some of the things we've been doing there are uh, putting down compost as, as an inoculum under the trees and then using uh, uh, wood chip and uh, mulch uh, underneath the trees to build organic matter. So organic matter levels in the orchard are up over 2% now um, underneath the trees. So we're happy, happy with that as a result. But you're constantly watering and, uh, you know, that material breaks down very, very quickly if, if the biology's active and present, um, then, then it's, it's gone. So we, we put a mulch of about 50 mil uh, underneath the trees and that's fairly coarse wood chippy material. Um, within six to eight months, uh, most of that is broken down. Um, and so the top, I guess the top five centimetres of, of soil is very heavily rich um, with organic matter. Um, so that does really well. 
we have quite row, uh, wide row spacings in the orchard. Um, so we, uh, we have a cover crop uh, or inter-row crop in there. Um, initially it was uh, only Rhodes grass, um, but we have some uh, native legumes that are, that are in there as well. There's a little bit of cerradella that we've introduced. Um, this year I used the, the disc cedar to put the same mix uh, that we put in the market garden into the orchard. So there's rows of uh, um, the oats, vetch and, and the brassica. Uh, again, just trying to build some diversity, um, get something winter active. The Rhodes grass is a summer active. Um, if we don't get rain, it, it hasn't died yet, which is pretty impressive. Um, but it, uh, if we do get rain, it's, it's just like a carpet of green. It's magnificent. Um, so it's very opportunistic in that respect. But it is only one species, so I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build some diversity in that. Uh, we also have banner grass as, as a windbreak, so that um, provides protection for the trees, but it's also habitat, and uh, so it's habitat for bugs, habitat for insects. Um, we don't use any fungicides uh, in the orchard. Uh, we, we try and limit our insecticides to, uh, to one, um, one application a year if we can. Um, what else do we do? Yeah, I think that probably covers the covers the bulk of them. But we, we do all the same things with fertilizer that we do. So all the um, the fertigations go out with humix or fulvix and, and fish and molasses. And so we're trying to feed and look after the biology as much as possible. Um, and we have moisture monitoring probes in um, in all our varieties. Uh, for those people that are asking orchard questions, um, we've got uh, three varieties of mandarins and, and one variety of limes. Um, all of them use water differently. All of them we use water at different times of the year. Um, so moisture probes were a very big learning for us. Um, so this one's a bit of a, there's a few parts in this question. First part is, do you have any evidence of improved for, um, food density, shelf life, pest and disease resistance as a result of your practices? Yes, yeah, so certainly pest and disease. Um, I think I mentioned before, we, we irrigate uh, our pumpkins with overhead sprinklers. Um, and we do it at night. So if, if there's ever a way to, to try and build powdery mildew in a pumpkin, that's, that's the way to do it. Um, and we don't, we don't put any fungicides out to control powdery mildew. Not to say we don't get powdery mildew. We, we have some limitations in what we do. And, and I put the management down to um, mostly nutrition. So we're, we're leaf testing pumpkins regularly. Um, and so we, we know we're at optimum levels for our nutrition. Um, manganese is a critical one for us. We, we have soil pH of about 8.2. Um, so manganese is not highly available in the soil. So we do, we do foliars of manganese, foliars of potassium. Um, you know, we'll use potassium silicate to build cell strength and um, protect against, uh, against fungicides. So the other part of the question was about there was a bit about shelf life. I know you've told me a story about one of the pumpkins. Yeah, yeah it's, it's an observation. It's, it's not a measurement. It's, it's not scientific. Um, we will get into that, though, with the natural capital accounting. So that's one of the things we want to do um, is we, we will look at food nutrition um, and whether what we're doing is, is it's giving us what we think it's giving us. Um, and we're prepared, prepared for a rude shock if it doesn't. Um, and we'll just have to continue doing what we're doing better. Um, but what we have had is um, we store pumpkins because we have a farmer's market that our, our two daughters run and we store them uh, in the shed. Uh, so picked perhaps towards the end of March and we've still got them there now. So, um, but when they break down, they don't, well, not all of them. Um, they just dehydrate. Um, so they don't go into that smelly mess. I don't, if there's growers out there that have had pumpkins broke down, they know they just go into a stinky, horrible mess. And, uh, and it's pretty ordinary, but we've had them just dehydrating. So um, that's an interesting observation and, and whether that's biologically related or not, or uh, I suspect more nutritionally related um, than anything else. Uh, we have uh, customers that buy our product through Kenningvale, through the Kenningvale markets, who buy our product specifically because the BRICS levels are, are high in the fruit. Um, some of them process them, so they need a minimum BRICS level for that. Um, and that minimum is eight. Last year we were at 15, so we we're happy with, with where those levels were. Um, so do you receive a bit of like a higher price on some of your, like your, man, your citrus and pumpkins because of the practices that you're implementing? No, we don't. Um, I think one of the things we've seen with our citrus though is that 
the benefit to us is, is in first grade pack out. And I put a fair bit of weight in the fact that we, we keep our nutritional levels fairly, fairly high. So we, uh, well, I say high, I mean optimum. Um, uh, we focus on that pretty heavily. We leaf test citrus three to four times a year, um, which is not the industry standard. It's usually once a year. So we're always tweaking um, we're always measuring. And that's the, the key to a lot of, a lot of what we do um, is the measuring and the tweaking. Um, and we have what we think of a pretty good first grade pack outs. And uh, yeah, you know, Shay, you're involved in stone fruit. Um, first grade pack outs is where the money is. Um, yeah. So if we can reduce our, our second grade of fruit or our non-marketable grade of fruit uh, as much as possible, um, yeah, that's, that's a win for us. And, uh, and I put most of that down to, um, to the nutrition in the plant. Yeah. So there's a comment here, I suppose, um, that says, I gather your costs of production are higher than conventional, but then you said your yields have increased and that led on to the higher price question. But is your profitability yeah. greater or less than when you farmed conventionally? Oh, it's better now. Yeah, much better now. Um, and, and, and don't make the assumption that because we're doing what we're doing now, our costs are greater. Uh, they're not. They're significantly less. Um, you know, I said we, you know, we've dropped our fertiliser impulse by, uh, well, nitrogen, for instance. Um, we're putting less than 100 units of N on our nitrogen for our nitrogen now. Um, previous practice conventionally was 250. Uh, with potassium about the same. So I think our potassium now is down to around about 110. So they're the bits I'm still tweaking with. I think I can get it lower than that. So um, yeah, I, yeah. There's those drivers that, that uh, you know, for your decision-making and um, you know, the social, the financial and the environmental. And, and as I said before, the financial is a big driver um, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what keeps, <laughs> keeps us profitable. So yeah, I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that it's gonna be more expensive um, uh, to, to go down this line. But that's where the transition stage is important. Um, you don't want it to be more expensive. Um, you, know, that you don't want to be going broke doing it. And we made that rookie area in that very first year. And uh, we, we actually doubled the amount of money we spent on establishing our crop and we halved our yields. Um, so that was a big learning curve for me. And that's, that's why I'm, I want to press that message of uh, do it small um, and do it in stages. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose you have that preferred supplier advantage, even if it is maybe not getting the pr pricing premium, but you have that preferred supplier, which is an advantage in itself, even though it's not as necessarily. Yeah. And one of the things that do, I mean, we do have the anecdotal feedback from, from Canning Vale that they're able to store our product longer. And that, that's a big marketing advantage, uh, particularly if you've got a flood in the market. So it means you can hold out for, for things to drop off in terms of supply into the market. And so um, you, you, you're better positioned if you can hang on to that product for longer. Um, there was just one other question that popped up. I know we're hitting, just hitting 1.30 now, but um, when you get your tests done on your soils and your leaves, uh, leaves and your soil, where do you get it done? Um, so ours go through um, Southern Cross Uni. Uh, and yeah, so it all goes to there. That through sweat? Uh, no. Okay, different one. Um, environmental Analysis Lab. Okay. At Southern Cross Uni in, uh, no, I've lost it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so there's a big one here, I'll read it out. So the three row, row weeder, that was an, um, there was an economic analysis done in broadacre cereal crops where it was showing that up to a certain density of wild radish, hand weeding, using backpackers, et cetera, it was more economical than spraying large proportion of paddocks that didn't need it. New technology using green on green scanning will change the economics again. It's an interesting point because yeah. that was one of the economies of scale questions that we had. Mm. Um, was there anything else you really wanted to add before we signed off today? Like your real take home message about starting off small and um, yeah. Um, only, I think that it's response to a question really, and, and you asked me it um, prior to the event. It was a, a question that came in earlier, so I just want to honour that question. It was about how I see uh, regenerative practices being applied in, in Broadacre. And, and I think I'd go back to those, um, I guess those principles that, I, that I, we try and farm by, and that's I, understanding what those principles are 
and, and how you can implement that on, on farm because the, the principles are universal in terms of how you, you deal with soil health. And um, it's just a matter of how you apply them. And, and as I've said in my own case, there's limitations to what we can do on our own farm. And, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, you know, I, I know that that's a limitation, but it, you know, that limitation is a challenge for me and it may not be, might be for others, but I'd, I'd like to try and overcome some of those if I can. Um, but it's, it's, it's understanding what's going on. You know, do the learning, do the reading, um, do the workshops, do whatever you need to do to understand it better if that's what interests you. And I, I said before, it's a mindset thing. Um, if that's the pathway you want to go down, then, uh, then you know, take responsibility for your learning and, and do that. Um, and that's, I think, the way you're going to get there. It's, it's not something that's going to be forced upon you. Um, you know, if, if that's the way you want to go, then, uh, then, then do it um, and, and learn what you need to do to, to implement it on your own property. It's very individual. Thanks, Tom. I think we'll wrap it up there. I think the, the chat box is going off with lots of thank yous and very informative and really interesting. And like we said before, all the webinars that we have run are going to be up online. Just give us a couple of days to get this one up there. But we have had likes of Nick Kentish um, really talking about that mindset and how to think about having that transition. And it's really good to hear that you back that up. So what I'd like to put out to everyone actually who's participating today is if there's anyone else out there that you think should we should get to talk to on a Regen WA webinar, please let us know. Um, we will continue to do these webinars as the time goes on. I think they're really valuable for everyone. So if you have anyone that you really would like to hear from, that we should chat with, um, please get in touch. Um, other than that, thank you so much everyone for joining us and especially you, Tom. No Thanks. Thanks everyone.